suppose talk through to power down of mind. And if we talk, now 500,000 they go summer us, call them hate speech. But fear not, my ego don't come. Ingo touch light every corner, nooks and cranny of all these bad, bad people where they spoil our country. <laughs> Every corner. Okay, some people be they hala say they want the power. Chai. Them be promise us say we go get light and power. Nah, nah. Them hustle so they so they they can't get the power. Hmm. But now they know they do anything with the power. Sheer. Every day dollar just they get the higher power. Over naira. See them talk say make we off mind. But then go say my ego don't come. So my people make you lie down. Yo, yo. Good evening to you, good morning to you, good afternoon to you from wherever you are watching from. Uh, this is Mayegun live, and thank you for joining me. Share the broadcast. So tonight, or whatever time you are watching this, this broadcast is uh, purposely for educational, you know, reason and all that. And at the same time, we just want to use tonight to further, I mean, to dig further into the history of uh, Yoruba people, where we were coming from, what happened to us along the way, and where did we probably, you know, think we'll be, and where are we, and where do you think we are going? History is so good that it can help reinvigorate you give you purpose, and then uh, make you see clearly if you are being, uh, being used for something that, uh, like Nigeria is today. So tonight, we are not going to really talk about uh, those rogues in Nigeria. I just want to, uh, you know, uh, I want us to uh, take uh, a moment uh, to uh, dig into our history, like I said, and hopefully, we will be inculcating this uh, level of, uh, you know, understanding in the younger generation who I believe are now the future. If we care about them, we should uh, care about the type of education and type of history they are being fed today in Nigeria. Our children are being fed with uh, histories that are doctored. They are being fed uh, and then are being told they are criminals, are heroes, right? Uh, they have been told that uh, their own ancestors, right? They were evil. Their ancestors were, in fact, eh, they have been told that uh, their ancestors will turn to the Orishas in Yoruba land. Yeah, they, uh, they were nothing but evil. Because of so many things that happened to us along the way, uh, slavery, uh, you know, slave trade, uh, which brought so many other things that eventually infiltrated uh, where we are. Or maybe if we never, if we don't stop teaching the generation uh, that uh, 
our future will probably lies uh, in their hands, the right history and tell them never to celebrate uh, thieves. Not like the thieves they have today. Uh, you know, so I'm going to be reading again. And I've got a lot of uh, this historical facts and books uh, it's ordered already. And I'm going to be sharing them with you as Yoruba. So tonight, if you are a Yoruba man, most of what I'm going to read to you, you know them. Some of you have forgotten them. But tonight, I may be able to rejig your memory, remind you of who you are, and then uh, never to be led eh, by your nose. Back in the days, one of the horrible things that happened to us as a race is the slavery, you know, the slavery where people were chained, uh, you know, in iron chains, gagged and killed, uh, you know, sold as uh, just like animals and all that. But today, the level of slavery we have is now called mental slavery. So mental slavery doesn't really carry chains physically. You don't see people walking about with chains anymore. But, uh, you know, their mind, their head and all that are being controlled by different kind of uh, messages that, uh, that they are being fed with. Therefore, many of them have uh, submitted to ideologies, to groups, to people whose only, uh, you know, goal was to enslave, I mean, were to enslave them. And they are doing so today without putting chains or cuffs in their hands. So if you are a Yoruba man, a friend of Yoruba, somebody interested in Yoruba people, I might be able to uh, get you more interested with things you can work with, uh, starting with uh, how did Yoruba people manage to build a civilization that today in 2022, eh? Yorubas have become uh, so backward compared to what uh, our progenitors projected uh, back then and to the result we have uh, today. Illiteracy, poor education, terrible one. I've taken uh, the minds of our people away from uh, critical thinking where they could probably make uh, critical decisions. Now they don't. People have delegated uh, their sense of reasoning to uh, people who just want to exploit them. So as a Yoruba man, I believe that what makes me stronger is understanding who I am. So if you have your children around, this is the, uh, you know, this is the kind of, uh, uh, you know, session of Maya Gun's diary, political, that if they are not in bed, they can enjoy this. This is history. So share the broadcast. Invite them. Tag those you should tag. Tell them that Maya Gun is here. Hmm? <laughs> Facebook, I we are supposed to be great people and we are still great people even though if you remember that uh, those who participated in kidnapping uh, Yorubas and selling them off as slaves when the Europeans arrived on the coast of uh, Yoruba land. They were Yorubas too, right? But today, if you also look at uh, those who have uh, contributed eh, to the state of Yoruba land today, if you are watching me from any part of Yoruba land, I want you to be honest uh, with yourself, okay? Your politics, politics of deceit, politics of uh, manipulation and falsehood, propaganda, they are never going to help any one of you. And I know you all love your thieves differently. But this time around, yeah, if you look at those who have uh, turned you to slaves in your own land, you will realize that uh, they have the same tribal mark as you. They speak the same language like you. They dress like you. They grew up among you. Therefore, you call them your brothers too. Some of you even call them your leaders. But when you look at the state of Yoruba land today, yeah, you will see nothing. 
but a state of uh, dejectedness where people wear their own frustration right all over their faces, helpless, and then, uh, well, helpless when uh, those who put them in that situation continue to weaponize same. So you realize that those who sold you, uh, sold our, our, our ancestors as slaves, and became Ologweru, Oluweru, and La Jakpa, La Jaka, and the rest of those. They were also Yorubas, but they had collaborators. The only difference today is that uh, the Yorubas of today, who claim to be leaders in Yoruba land, and watch all these goes to this dust, yeah? They are doing so in partnership with Nigeria, unfortunately, with the poor education, miseducation, they have succeeded in holding us down. But we have history, and I'll tell you this, we, have, we are meant to be even bigger and greater than so many of these uh, you know, European countries or the West, as they will say. Because see, we have accessed civilization before these people could even smell it. That was why the first scholars, many of the, the first Europeans who came, and they saw the organized society that we had in Yoruba land, so organized, so transparent, no crime, and all that. They pen, uh, you know, they pen uh, words on paper. Uh, wow. So the only way you could get these people to obey you is to infiltrate, adulterate, and destroy all they hold dear, their culture tradition if you can do that and at the same time finally if you can take away their language the job is done that was how we lost it and we've never recovered even when we choose to say oh we are on our own we are not well back 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 way back eh we were meant to be great people because we had history i'll read some of them now so like i said tonight is uh reading so all you have to do is sit back relax and uh maybe at some point we can take uh, contributions as well which is you can phone in and add to omission or addition whatever is it going to be it is the history time now so i'll take you back the development of the early yoruba society what was the Yoruba society like in the early days? I'm talking about centuries ago, hundreds of centuries ago. I'll give you some reminders. After the establish, establishment of the early Yoruba kingdoms, the people began to advance in terms of civilization and structure. The Iron Age brought about a significant transformation as it would stimulate a great advancement of culture. The Iron Age first came to uh, Yoruba land in early 700 BCE. According to archaeologists, the knowledge of iron working might have arrived in West Africa through pot production. So when the Europe were documenting the Iron Age when, you know, they discovered that it, it must have even like started in Yoruba land, which is part of uh, what is uh, today's uh, West Africa, coast of West Africa, iron making. Now, they said the iron making process is a dangerous occupation that requires the use of a, of a high amount of heat. Due to this, most iron smelting centers were located far from residential areas. Talking about organization, talking about structure. A society that was already running, so organized, civilized. I want you to pay attention to the key words, by the way. That's what I do when I read. Some key words, right? So, usually in the forest, where iron beating Sorry, where iron beating rock or rock clay is readily available. This iron, you know, this iron beating rock clay 
is heated to remove the iron from his ore, where it is cooked and sold to the blacksmith as iron ingots. The blacksmith used the ingot to fabricate tools. Do you see that production level? 700 BC. Hmm? In the Yoruba culture, iron smelting and the fabrication of tools from iron is overseen by one of their deities known as Ogun. They will tell you our, you know, our own uh, Orishas. Orisha in Yoruba land means the people that Olodumare or Ori Shada. What that simply means is that uh, in the flood, I mean, in, in you know, in, in the garden of uh, heads, there are some certain heads that will become or play a certain role, right? And people believe that among the millions of heads, and if you become somebody who plays a significant role, your creator must have chosen you. So this is where people who actually contributed to the civilization, the protection, eh? and everything that made Yoruba land, if you're a Yoruba man, to the point that people loved them so much that when they died, eh, some people dedicated their lives to worship them as Orishas. But they will tell you they were evil. All this, all this idol, 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 all this, you know? Those were your own uh, ancestors. They were your ancestors. They were not evil, as you probably have been taught. Now, let's continue. Ogun, also known as, I mean, Ogun Lakaye, meaning the wielder of arms of working people. Ogun is believed to be the god of iron and the patron of all working men. Iron smelting workshops serve as shrines to this deity and sacrifices were rendered to the deity in the workshop. Blacksmiths were not the only ones that worship Ogun. It is believed that people using any form of metal in their daily activities like sculptors, farmers, Woodworkers, hunters, etc., etc., offered sacrifices to this deity for good luck. Do you know that uh, if our forebearers eh, were able to, to write things down, Ogun will not be seen as uh, evil today. Ogun would have probably be seen as the inventor of iron. In this world, let me, I mean, ask me how from history, eh? Africans have already been mining iron ore. How did they know that they have to dig into the ground and dig out and discover that this particular sand is different from the normal sand? And if we melt this particular sand together, it can form iron that we can use for tools or anything else, how did they discover that? Ogun became known and prominent because of his uh, iron uh, work. They said he's the god of iron, meaning he was an expert, a specialist, possibly a scientist, who discovered iron ore before the Europeans, thousands of years before Europeans who ever even like think of, let's go to Africa. Remember that, so that then you will know they are not uh, evil, if not because of what happened to us. Now, let's continue. The discovery of iron was the second greatest discovery in West Africa. After the discovery of agriculture, I mean, Africans discovered that they had to grow their food. Yeah? Nobody taught them that. They became food sufficient they were not hungry they were living big living large living that the europeans were like what what is you know what i mean so 
But you will never see it anywhere that uh, Africans discovered iron or uh, iron hall. Have you ever read it anywhere? I say, Yoruba man, now you know. The Iron Age impacted the Yoruba culture positively, especially as it helped in the improvement of farming tools. Their first fabricated tools were crude at first, but improved considerably, considerably with time. The improved tools made it possible to clear a large portion of land and dig until the land, I mean, until the land for agricultural purposes. With more refined tools, more land became accessible for agriculture. Early Yoruba farmers learned quite early, learned quite early on the importance of leaving the ground fallow to retain soil fertility. The presence of more accessible land led to increased crop production, which eventually resulted in farmers developing methods of harvesting, storing, and protecting crops. With an improved storage process, food became readily available, which led to a rise in the population in Yoruba land. The gradual increase in the population led to the emergence of settlements in more areas of the country, Yoruba land. As the settlements increased, the forest separating the settlements from each other soon became open farmland. The improvement and availability of tools gave rise to various professions and facil I mean, facilitated the division of labor. While farming was the main occupation of the Iron Age, some men became more involved in hunting due to greatly improved tools. From the onset, hunters were held in high regard. Apart from supplying the community with meat, other professions depended on them. For instance, potters and iron smelters depended on hunters to find good clay deposits. Also, the people relied on them to provide security against raiders, thieves, and invaders, and to help clean brooks and streams. If there was a need for a group to relocate, the responsibility to find a new spot to settle and the best route to reach it usually fell on the hunters. See how our people were creative, were building to what we have today that we are about, they are about to take from us. Right? Another notable profession made possible by the Iron Age, Yoruba land, was the arts. Hmm. Some of the earliest sculptures were done in terracotta. Also, the earliest wood carvings were made possible through the use of iron tools. Most of these carvings were used in house decorations as well as shrines. As you can possibly guess, the Iron Age had an impact on the economy. Iron tools improved the harvesting of oil palm trees, which was one of their major crops. The development of tools and skills helped the Yoruba farmers incorporate more crops into their farming. Among the many crops they planted was cotton, which opened up the weaving industry. The Yoruba also cultivated plants to use in dyeing clothes. The coming of Iron Age was a huge blessing as it led to improved skills and better management of the environment. Hmm. People learned how to build better and stronger homes, and this led to the people erecting buildings that housed their extended families under the same roof. This birthed the concept of Agboile, a compound for the family that consisted of many homes with a number of courtyards around which the homes were positioned. Architectural and I mean, aesthetic improvements 
to the Agboile turned it into a strong and safe haven. Plasters were used for the walls, which increased the safety and durability of the home. Also, weaving thatched roofs became an art, and the roofs would last for generations. With only the need for minor repairs, the Agboile gradually became a competition, with people trying to outdo each other in regard to decorations. These decorations also included shrines. The rivalries between compounds resulted in artistic expressions like Uriki. This is a poetry in which, sorry, this is poetry in which each lineage glorifies itself and preserves its history. Facial markings also became a way to identify with one's ancestry. All of this contributed to the development of the Yoruba people's identity and distinctiveness, especially when it came to lineages and settlements. The growth and development of the Yoruba society started with the smallest unit, the family. The oldest living male member of the family was seen as the leader. He was the keeper of the family's customs, secrets, and totems. That is, I mean, those are objects treasured and passed down by the leaders of the family or group. The leader was, I mean, the leader is seen as the family's spiritual guide and the one who tended to the family shrine. What started as a closely knit family soon grew into a large group bound by shared beliefs, values, and rules. At some point, the leader of each settlement began wearing objects that helped indicate they were the leader. There were different types of organizations in the earliest settlements. Still, the most common was the age grade, which was used to provide appropriate tasks for the people in the Agbuile, like keeping an open space clean. Over time, the concept of age grade evolved and began to include new rules and regulations. Apart from one's compound or lineage, the age grade was one of the most popular ways to identify oneself among the early Yoruba people. Most adult men were farmers and were assisted by their wives and children. A typical day in the Agboile started at dawn, where most men went out to, the, to their farm. Those who were left, I mean, left behind included the elderly, children, and those with a home-based occupation. The homebound people carried out domestic activities while the children played under the watchful eyes of the aged and nursing mothers. By the late afternoon, the farmers will return home, bearing produce and firewood. Dinner will be served in the evening, and the hours after dinner were used for socializing. The men conversed while sharing a keg of palm wine, while the women performed light domestic chores. The children listened and told stories, usually folklore. The Agboile was one of the building blocks of the economy. Each Agboile took produce to the village markets, and some Agboiles became known for the things they sold. One of the earliest mode of trade was battering, although the Yoruba later used cowrie. 
she can miss recovery shells as a form of payment. One of the triumphs of the early Yoruba people was the development of traditional medicine. Over the centuries, each settlement accumulated knowledge of various herbs to treat illnesses. They also gained vast knowledge of various, I mean, sorry, on the nature of different diseases. Each settlement had a professional herbalist that the people depend on for treatment. Over time, professional herbalists evolved into specialists, that is, those specializing in treating mental diseases, delivery of babies, etc., etc. Over the years, the settlement set up rules and regulations in regards to herbalists. You they follow the birth of a baby was celebrated in the Agbole for several weeks. The older women within the compound served as the baby's mother in what is called collective nurturing. They also helped the new mother by passing on their knowledge to her. Children, both living and those yet unborn, were regarded as important members of the compound. It is believed that everything a lineage owned belonged to the next generation. This shows that the early Yorubas valued their children and invested heavily in their training and education. The next generation's education was a collective effort, and each Agboile raised their ancestral, I mean, sorry, each Agboile raised their young in its image with the people passing down their knowledge in their lineage profession. Hang on. Passing down their knowledge of their ancestry history, rather. They also trained their young in, I mean, so they also trained their young in their lineage profession. For instance, some Agboile, some Agboiles were known for a particular trade. And the people of that compound would often continue practicing, practicing it in the next generation. Birth were not the only celebrations in the Agboile. There were also village and lineage festivals, weddings, and funerals. The Yorubas celebrated weddings in a grand style. They involved three major activities. The introduction ceremony, the betrothal ceremony, and the ceremonial journey of the bride back to her husband's Agbuile. Nowadays, the Yoruba people call their wedding celebrations Owanbe, and, and, and they have simplified the ceremonies into just two, the introduction and the engagement. The Yorubas believed in exogamy, which means marriages often occurred outside of one's family and clan. Hmm. If they follow the early Yorubas, eh? they believed in exogamy. Exogamy is all we practice mostly these days, eh? where you know that uh, when it is time for you to marry, you cannot marry somebody from your lineage. You can't marry anybody from your family. You can't marry your family member. You can't marry your brother. You can't marry your sister. Yorubas, from the early, 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 early age, they gave identity. So to avoid that, eh? Very, very, very smart people. We couldn't have been more prouder, you know that. Yeah? So the Yorubas also practiced a patrilinear kinship system whereby every child belonged to their father's lineage. 
and could only inherit from that lineage. A woman married into a family from another compound automatically became her husband's family and could never revert to her father's family, even after her death. Mourning was another event done collectively in the Agboile. Mourning could go on for days, especially if it was the death of a young adult. In the early days, most children died in infancy and few made it to adulthood. The people always buried their dead in their compound. Overall, the Agboile was one of the most important factors in the development of the early Yoruba civilization. Each Agboile had a system of government under the leadership of the Olori Ebi, who acted as the ruler and the priest. Each village or settlement had a government with an exalted ruler, chiefs, rules and laws guiding them. Disputes and chorus were settled by the Olori Ebi, the oldest man in the village or compound. But he had, he had the help of others or other elders. They exercised judicial and penal authority in all matters concerning the lineage. One of the Olori Ebi's duties was to make room for members of the lineage to express their opinions. Do you hear that? Our forefathers, our forebearers, our progenitors, they allowed for democracy. Call it democracy. Eh? They allowed everybody to speak. Speak your mind. Say your mind. Now, inside Agbole, they don't shut people up. But you see this generation of... Uh, what is it they call them? Gen, gen, gen Z or whatever they call them. Some of these uh, your uncles and aunties, Yoruba uncles and aunties in their 50s, 60s, that will be telling you, that will be asking you to respect and respect them, even when they are saying nonsense, even when they are acting, uh, you know, foolishly. And you are even trying to correct them and say, think about your age, sir. You are an elderly person. Why are you thinking like an idiot? They will quickly ask you that uh, you need to respect elders, respect elders. When your elders are talking, you don't talk, even when they are talking nonsense. That is very much on Yoruba. It is not Yoruba. Okay? If you are talking eh, in any way, and some people wanted to shut you up because they are older than you, trying to keep you short, just tell them that uh, when they tell you that they respect your elders, elders are talking. When your elders are talking, you don't, you don't say anything again. Just tell them that they uh, are Elder sorry, which elder is talking? I bet you are If you say that to them, they will say you are an Asha, but you are not. You are just being a real Yoruba son, a true Yoruba man or woman. I'm telling you that because that's who you are. You are not meant to keep quiet when people are acting, uh, you know, when they are acting uh, dangerous around you, when they are acting, or if they are not acting their age, you should never keep quiet, okay? Even if that person is your father. Okay, that is older than you, right? You should still respectively, I mean, respectfully speak your mind. Don't let anybody shut you up for wanting to speak up. Don't ever. And don't let them, you know, don't let them blackmail you and say, hey, Yorubas respect. No, 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 don't listen to that. Because the early Yorubas, they are smarter than some of these rogues, these entitled uh, dumbos mm -hmm. who only want to brag about age, but they have nothing else. Absolute emptiness in them. Do not let them eh, shut you up. Because as a Yoruba man, you, are, you would always speak out. Your forebearers, your forefathers, they allowed that. So, your lineage to express your opinions. The earliest Yorubas had a distinct religion and they followed the religious guidance of the oldest members of the family. Also, as small occupations were established, patron gods and goddesses began to appear. Farmers, hunters, 
and market women all are the god or goddess attached to their profession. All for good luck. Date, excuse me, deities were accepted. Excuse me. So deities were accepted and worshipped in Yoruba land. The number of deities worshipped varied according to settlements. In Yoruba, sorry, the Yoruba believed that all existence could be found in two realms, the lower realm and the upper realm. The upper realm consists of, I mean, consists of uh, two spheres, a higher and a lower. The higher is overseen. Listen to this, so for you to know that uh, if you are a Yoruba man, you are supposed to understand the mythology about uh, creation, the mythology about, uh, you know, God, Ele Dumari, because your forefathers, they've already figured all of that out. Nobody brought salvation to you. Your forefathers, they gave you salvation, well clearly explained. Unfortunately, colonialism happened to us. Unfortunately. But look at it this way. We, the, we Yorubas, we believe that all existence could be found in two realms. Okay? The lower realm and the upper, upper realm. The upper realm also consists of uh, two spheres, the higher and the lower, which is the higher sphere, the lower sphere. Listen to the breakdown now. The higher sphere in Yoruba mythology is overseen by Olodumari, which many, many people believe is God. We call God. Olodumari is the highest. Nothing is above Olodumari in Yoruba tradition and religion. Now, they believe that uh, Olodumari is the creator of all things. Now, the second sphere, the one closer to humans, is the home of gods like Ifa, Ogun, and Obatala. Divination, you know, divination, the ability to tell the future, was an important part of the Yoruba culture. It was made possible through Ifa. Another development in the Yoruba culture was the belief in the afterlife. The Yorubas believed that people who died went on to live in another realm. This explains why their dead were buried with articles of clothing. The root of their belief in the afterlife began with their idea that each individual has a minimum of three spiritual beings living within them. The first spirit, Emi, resides in the heart and lungs and is powered by the winds entering the nostrils. The same way fire is powered by the wind, produced by a blacksmith's bellows. The word emi can be translated as either life or breath, because without life, there is no breath. And without breath, there is no life. It is with emi that a man moves, walks, eats, speaks, sees, hears, and makes love. The second spiritual being is Ojiji, which means shadow. Every individual is followed by their shadow throughout their life. And when he or she dies, the shadow also follows them to their final destination in the afterlife. The third being is called Eleda, meaning spirit. The Eleda is regarded as the guiding soul of an individual. 
and it requires regular sacrifices to continue serving the individual. So these are the basic spiritual beings that all individuals must have to live. The other types of spiritual beings can be acquired at birth or over the course of one's lifetime by making agreements with the gods in charge of those beings. At death, these spiritual beings evacuate the body of the individual and await his or her pres presence in the afterlife. Apart from the beings, the individual is also welcomed by their family members who had already died. Do you understand that belief system now? There are many, many of you who also uh, who understand this, but in a different concept. So that is why many people will tell you that those who brought uh, Christianity, those who brought uh, Islam and all of that, yeah, because uh, they were able to document ideas. If you look back very well, majority of uh, the rules and teachings and every other things, they actually got them from the teachings of our own uh, forbearers, unfortunately. They, 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 they adulterated them along the way. Look at us. So a person's afterlife depended on the deeds they had done during their life. After dying, the Eleda reports the person's earthly deeds to Olorun, the ruler of the heavens. The good souls are sent to Orunriri, good heaven. And the wicked souls who are guilty of witchcraft, theft, or murder are sent to Orunbuburu, wicked heaven. Or Orun, uh, you know, as punishment, something like that. So, after life, people believe that if you are in this life oh, and you do well, just the same way you probably have another belief system too, right? But our own four bearers, they've already said all those things. In motion, long time ago. So even though missionaries introduced science and the Christian belief of the afterlife, there are still Yorubas who believe in the concept of having a guardian soul, a leader, that is in, I mean, that is in charge of their destiny, a shadow Ojiji that follows them through life, recording their actions, and an Emmy that gives them breath to live. There are about 100 million practitioners of the Yoruba faith today, just for the record. Another popular belief in Yoruba land was and still is reincarnation. Yoruba believe that the dead will be reincarnated into one of their descendants, which is a belief that has influenced many Yoruba names. For instance, the name Babatunde is given to a male child whose grandfather died close to his birth, while Yetunde or Iyabo is given to a female child whose grandmother had passed away. Recently, the name Babatunde means father has returned and Yetunde or Iyabo translates to mother has returned. There is also the concept of Akudaya, which roughly translates to death without living earth. This is, a, this is similar to the concept of ghosts in other cultures. The difference is that the ghosts in Yoruba land go on to live new lives. They start new families and may possibly live until they die of old age. Not everyone who dies becomes an Akudaya. But if a person dies a wrongful death or before their predestined time of death, the chance of becoming one increases. After death, the person's soul leaves their body, travels to another village or town, and goes on living until their predestined time of death. The people in the new town are able to see and touch this individual, which means they view the Akudaya as just another person. However, the moment a single person becomes aware 
Diakudaya flees and move to another place to start all over. This is another belief that is still prevalent in present day Yoruba land. Now, let's talk about the defied, I mean, the, the, in the defied Yoruba heroes. The ones they told you, or maybe somehow you have told your children that uh, they, they are evil because they are Orishas, because people worship them, celebrate them and all of that. Some of you didn't even want to know the stories behind them. Not knowing that many, many Orishas you have in Yoruba land today, all the Orishas you have in Yoruba land today, the ones Yorubas eh, who once lived like me and you. But in their time, they made so much mark to shape eh, what you and I have come to know as Yoruba culture, tradition, religion, and Yoruba people that you see today. So when they say they are evil or they are idol this or that, you will probably need to understand why people choose never to forget them. The only way to remember them is that so many people believe that through them, if they could do all they did when they were alive, eh? now that they have died, they could, I mean, Yorubas believe that we could continue to summon their spirits to appeal to their spirit, to fight on behalf of Yoruba people and be the, be, be the intercede, I mean, what's the call that thing? To intercede for us between uh, the uh, Yorubas and Olodumare, the, uh, the creator of uh, everything. So Yorubas dedicated that time and said, pray to them and then uh, we can appease them through them and then we can appease God. These were individuals who shaped the Yoruba land that you have today, they are not uh, evil. They've never been one. But here we go. How did they become defied? How did they become heroes and then uh, worshipped for centuries after they long died? I mean, dead. Somebody said they are intermediaries. I like that. Intermediaries. So let's go to that. It says, the ancient Yoruba heroes were not just heroes. They were also kings turned gods, goddesses, and deities. The origin story of the Yorubas cannot be told without speaking of them. They were so revered that each of them had a dedicated group of people, Agboile, and villages that worshipped them. Before Britain colonized Nigeria, which brought about a massive missionary campaign. The primary religion of the Yorubas was idol worship. Some of their gods were Odudua, Shongo, Ogun, Oya, which happened to be a woman, and Oshun, a woman. Although there were many, many more. So, these heroes are still worshipped today, but idol worship is now the minority among the Yorubas. Many Yorubas are now Christians. They are now Muslims. But uh, because this is us, this is our history, right? Many, many Yorubas still identify and continue to identify with, their, with our own ancestors, no matter who we are today. That's one thing about us, right? So, and that's it, yeah. Even with many people identifying as uh, Christians and uh, Muslims or Muslims. For Odudua. Now, this is what you have to know. How Odudua became God. I mean, when you say with this God, eh? An intermediary. It is only befitting that the first God to be discussed is Odudua. As he is one of the heroes who cannot be left out when discussing the Yorubas. Odudua was coined from the name Odu, T O Da Iwa, meaning author of existence. The author of existence. Yoruba historians have stated that Odudua was the son of Olodumare. You might recall that Odudua was sent to earth via a chain. This earned him the name Atenworo, meaning 
one who descends from a chain. In the early days, Ileife had, sorry, Ileife had close to 13 communities and each community had its own oba, a ruler or a king. Oduduwa was popular among most of these communities and this allowed him to overthrow Obatala, his brother, from the throne and take over. It also led to hostilities between Oduduwa and Obatala, the latter of whom had, according to some versions of the legend, founded Ileife on orders from Olodumare, the supreme god. Oduduwa changed the decentralized system of Ileife to a centralized one and created the title of Horni. Previously, there were 13 Obas, but with Oduduwa's new title, there was only one ruler of Ife, Oduduwa. Oduduwa lived a fulfilling life with a large family. He had multiple wives. Omonide, his favorite, and Adetinri, and nursing. Uh, he also had many children, including Oruto, Inuade, Ajagunla, and Ifagbamila, just to name a few. After Oduduwa's peaceful death, the Yoruba started to worship him. Human sacrifices were offered to him until the time of the British protectorate. Another hero then is Ogun. Ogun was the or of Ife after Oduduwa. He was skilled in metal work, which earned him the title of Iron, I'm mean, sorry, the title of uh, God of Iron after his death. Ogun's expertise in hunting made people call him Oshin, Imole, which means chief among the divinities. According to Ife mythology, when the other gods came to earth, Ogun cleared the path for them with a metal axe and had a dog as his companion. Ogun loved being alone on the hilltop. But when he was tired of his lonely life, he came down the hill, clothed in fire and blood. He wanted to mingle with the people, so he took fronds from a palm tree and went to Ire, where he was crowned king. Ogun's death is interesting. His subject refused to pay him the respect, I mean, the respect he wanted. So, he killed them, and they killed himself. But he wasn't buried. He disappeared into the earth. But he told his people that whenever they called him, he would answer. Some part of Yoruba land still offer sacrifices to Ogun. The main items used for sacrifice are iron and dogs because of his love for hunting and dogs. Another hero of Yoruba history was Oromion. Oromion or Oronyon, also called Oromion, by the way, Oronyon, also called Oromion, was the grandson of Odudua and the son of Ogun. A peculiar fact about him is that he was bathed after his mother had an affair with both Ogun and Odudua. Thus, he is known as the man of two fathers. His skin tone carved out his name. He was mostly light-skinned, like his father, Ogun, but he was dark-skinned in some parts, like his grandfather, Odudua. This led to the creation of the name Oromiyon, which is to say Oron Ni Omo Niyon, meaning the child has chosen to be controversial. Oronyon was brave and a great hunter. At that time, Ileife had no military, so he took it upon himself to defend it. This made him the first Akogun general of Ife. 
During one of the earliest wars, Oba Lufon, Ogbogbo Dini, the fourth or Neofife, sent Oromiyo off with his brother to conquer Igodomi Godo, the historical name of the Benin Empire. Oba Lufon's aim was for Oromiyo to die since Oromiyo or Oromiyo was giving him trouble. Unfortunately for Oba Lufon, Oromiyo didn't die. He actually won the war. But he didn't go back to Ife instead. He stayed at Igodomi Godo. However, he noticed that the people of Igodomi Godo didn't like him. This made them uncomfortable and they felt it was wrong to rule them when he wasn't from their land. So, he left. Before he left, he took the daughter of Ego's chief as his wife, and they had a child together named Eweka. Ego was located nearby, and the people accepted Eweka more willingly. He became the first Oba of Bini. Some sources had it that Oromiyo was the first ruler of Bini, who then passed the throne to his son so he could continue his explorations. Again, that is also open for contestation because uh, of history, as we say. Oromiyo moved northward with his large army. Eventually, he found a secure place where he established the Ojo Empire, calling it Ojo Ile. After conquering a nearby village, he took another wife. Oromiyo was a great traveler and explored many different places. After his adventures, he went back to Ileife and demanded that the, the, I mean, the throne be handed to him. Despite being Ogun's youngest son, because Oromiyo was a warrior and highly feared, the fifth Orni of Ife stepped down so he could take over. He ruled for a short while, but eventually he wanted to continue his adventure. So he left the village. But before leaving, he told the people of Ife that if they needed him to protect them, they should make some incantations to summon him. He assured them that he would come to save them. There was a peace in Ileife until Oromiyo's enemies attacked the city. The people called out to Oromiyo with the proper incantations, and he came back to fight for them. But while killing his enemies, he mistakenly, he mistakenly killed some of his own people, including his best friend. This left him devastated, agonized by what he had done. He drove his staff into the ground and left on his horse. The Yorubas never saw him again. Oromiyo was a great warrior who successfully ruled two, possibly, or three Yoruba kingdoms and established the Oyo Empire. The staff he left behind is now known as the Staff of Oromiyo, and it is a tourist attraction today in Ife. There's another story that about the staff by the historians as well today that says that uh, the staff, when Oromiyo in fact left, yeah, the staff sprung God like Okiti and he continued to grow and grow and grow until he became that tall. It wasn't a tree, it wasn't anything. It was like Okiti until what, what it is uh, today. But history is so good. It's so rejuvenating. It kind of gets you to want to know more. You know what I mean? Then once you get to know more, then you begin to question where, who, I mean, who are you today? Where are you today? Why are we what we are today? If we have more people who can indeed eh, discover who they are, they will never be moved by the roguish uh, Yoruba criminal politicians taking advantage of us, telling us to stay in this contraption because we cannot stay on our own. Yes, we can. Here is another hero of Yoruba's uh, history from the early stay, I mean, early, early, early years. Ajaka, Ajaka, the son of Oromiyo, was the only legendary king 
to reign the Oyo Empire twice. As he was removed from throne and then called back to reclaim the throne, even though warfare was the order of the day, Ajaka was a man of peace. Due to his calm nature, he was made to step down to allow his fierce brother, Shongo, to rule. After Shongo's death, Ajaka was called back to reclaim the throne, but his rule must have surprised the people. He had changed a lot during the years, and he had become even fiercer than Shongo. He killed the maternal relations of Shongo with arrows mounted on birds. He waged war with literally everybody, including over 1,000 of his chiefs and princes. Ajaka had special people called medicine men who made charms for him. After the war, the medicine men requested to return to their homes, but Ajaka refused. He was afraid that other kings would request their services and that they would get charms as well. Seeing that Ajaka was not ready to let go, the mercy men all vanished except one, Elenre. Ajaka was furious and he took his anger out on Elenre. Ajaka attempted to kill Elenre, but all his attempts were futile until Ijaei, Elenre's wife, told Ajaka what to do. Ijaei told him to pull some grass from Elenre's roof to make him powerless. Another version of the story claims that uh, it was Omolaja, one of Ajaka's maids, who, who was sleeping with Elenre, who told Ajaka to decapitate Elenre's with a sharp palm leaf blade. Ajaka's men followed the directives provided by the snitch and then cut off Elenre's head. His head fell into Ajaka's arms, who caught it unconsciously. The head became stuck to his hand, and all attempts to take it off were worthless. This drained Ajaka because the head ate every food and drank brought to him. Ajaka was dying, and many magicians were called to neutralize the charm. Only one was able to succeed, Ashawo. When Ashawo entered Ajaka's chambers, he prostrated himself before Elinri's head and explained that he had no other choice but to come because it was the king's request. By doing this, Ashawo emphasized how powerful Elinri was and he praised him for all his magic works and how he had defeated a lot of people. Elinri was pleased with, his, with this and rode off Ajaka's hand to form a river at Oyo called Odo, Elinri or if I pronounce that right, Elenre or Elenre, Elenre's river. His wife, Ijaini, also formed a river at Oyo, but Elenre ordered the river to remain stagnant. The earth incident caused Ajaka to make a rule that no king will be present at any, I mean, at an execution in the future. There is no record of what happened to Ajaka after this event. This is why. Uh, kings in Yoruba land, they don't see dead people. You get that now? If somebody, if they have to cut somebody's head off right now, they will quickly turn and then they will quickly cover the, the face of the king because of what happened to Ajaka, a former king in Ife. Culture, tradition. Mm -hmm. I didn't say Ashawo, Ashawo, somebody who did Awo, who studied Awo. Another one here, Shongo. Shongo is the most popular Orisha, which is a spirit known to interact with humans. Shongo, also called Jakuta, was the second son of Oromiyo. He was wild and had a fairy temper. Shongo's brother, Ajaka, was the ruler of Oyo Empire before Shongo came to power. The Olowu, which is the ruler of the Owu Kingdom, and Ajaka's cousin constantly intimidated Ajaka, making him appear less powerful to the people. 
the Olowu once forced Ajaka to pay tribute to him. Despite the fact that Ajaka was also a king, this led to Ajaka's removal from the throne. Shango then took over. And when, when the Olowu asked Shango to pay tribute to him, Shango refused. This caused a fight during which Shango made Olowu and his army fear him by emitting smoke and fire from his mouth. They never bothered him again. One day, Shango desired to worship at his mother's burial ground, but he was unable to because he didn't remember her name. His mother, the daughter of Elenkwe, a Nupe king died when he was an infant. Now, let me. There's something I want to say here as well. In Yoruba land today, because of uh, poor and adulterated kind of education, that the succeeding generations, especially the current uh, political leaders in Yoruba land or those who parade themselves as the traditional rulers in Yoruba land. You see? And then you see the generation of uh, some of these young Yorubas who are always, whenever they want to throw their begotten their political card, especially the one they are throwing because of this uh, call the demented Tifnumbu of Lagos. Yeah? They will tell you that uh, some people are not Yorubas enough. I mean, they believe that uh, if your father is a Yoruba man and your mother hmm, is an Awusa man or an Igbo woman, I mean, sorry, Awusa woman or an Igbo woman, that makes you eh, not a valid Yoruba. They are spreading it, not that it actually make any sense per se, but we have a generation of people that uh, because of uh, political and because of uh, what Nigeria has become, yeah, they are very quick to tell their fellow Yorubas that they are not Yoruba enough. One of the most popular kings, one of the, I mean, the, in fact, the most popular king, the most uh, revered uh, hero in Yoruba history, Shango, his mother, was Snoopy? Yes. Nupe. But in Yoruba land, it will say Baba Omo, Lolo Omo, Kusomo Alinle Yoba, except for those who's, uh, who are identifying with uh, men who are not their real fathers. In Yoruba land, oh, remember that, yeah? We have many, many of you who are going to have to battle the generation of uh, young, young Yorubas that have been misled because of this political tribal politics in Yoruba land of today. They are not doing them because of uh, any other thing, because that is what their political leaders told them. If you don't follow Tifnumbu, then you probably you are not a real Yoruba. Most of them are the actual Omoalis who are calling uh, Baba Oni Baba their fathers. Do you get that now? Or Shongo? Shongo happened to be birthed by a Nupe mom and he served Yoruba land well. Just so you know. So one day, by the way, they said that uh, when Shango became the when Shango became uh, a laughing, 
of Ojo, right? His own story. If I'm going to continue from that of his uh, mom, who happened to be the daughter of a lengue, a lengue, a nupe king. To obtain a name, Shango commissioned a tattoo. That is a uh, king executioner and a Aousa slave. There, there are various accounts on the number and type of people is sent to Nupe. They were to travel to the land of the Nupe. Speci I mean, specifically where his mother was from to offer the sacrifice of a cow and the horse for his mother. Their mission was to listen to his mother's name when the sacrifice was being offered. Upon reaching the town, Oba Elingpe entertained the men sent by his grandson and offered them drinks and food. The Aousa slave got drunk, but the Tetu was very careful and avoided drinking. When the sacrifice started, only the Tetu paid attention and heard Shongo's mother's name when it was mentioned. When the, when the men returned to Oyo, the Tetu was rewarded with the money since he knew the name of Shongo's mother. The Aousa slave was punished. He was given 122 razor cuts for failing to follow Shongo's instructions. When the cuts had healed, the women in the palace, including Shongo's wives, thought they were beautiful. So they told this to Shongo, leading him to make a rule that every royal should bear these cuts. Being one of the royals, Shongo handed himself over to the markers to cut him with the razor, but he could only bear two cuts on his arm. However, this gave him an idea. Oko was a very powerful region. As it bore the central seat of the government, Shongo wanted to bring this seat to Oyo, but he knew that the prince of Oko would refuse. So he devised a strategy to use the Aousa slave's court to achieve his goal. He sent the Aousa slave, Amakas, to the prince at Oko. They had to convince the royals of the beauty of these courts. The royals saw the slave and believed that the marks would look good on them as well. The Makas made the courts on them while they performed some rites. On the third day, Shongo attacked Oko and overtook it because the royals were too weak to fight. He transferred the seat of government from Oko to Oyo just as he wanted. Shongo reigned for seven years, during which he made conquest and showed his strength. He also made charms. We, I mean, you know, there was a particular one that he made that caused lightning. One day, he wanted to try a new experiment. He ascended Ajaka Hill with his slaves and cousins intending to try out this new idea of creating a storm with the charm. Although he thought the idea to be useless, it actually worked. A little too well, in fact. The charm started a storm, and lightning struck palace, igniting a fire. Before they could descend the hill to quench the fire, many of Shango's wives and children had already died. Seeing that Shango was the reason behind the whole misfortune, he was made to renounce his throne. He was then brought to the court of his grandfather, Elinkwe, king of Nupe. Not all of his power were against him. I mean, not, not all of his people were against him, though. Some wanted a peaceful resolution to the matter, and they offered to help him find wives who could bear him children. But because Shango couldn't stand having even a single person being against him, he left Oyo with some followers, including his head slave and favorite servant, Biri. However, Biri didn't like Shango's decision 
and encouraged Shongo to turn back and start a new life with the wives that had been offered, in, I mean, offered to him, Shongo refused and Biri left him. The other followers followed in Biri's footstep. Shongo was left alone, which devastated him further, resulting in him hanging himself on a sheer tree. His friends heard of his death and they paid homage by burning his body and burying the remains under the same tree before also committing I mean, suicide one by one. Billy was the first to commit suicide and he was followed by other slaves and some, I mean, some of Shongo's cousins. The death ended with Shongo's favorite wife, Oya. Some say Shongo didn't commit suicide but entered into the ground and disappeared. Another claim that I mean another claim is that he transformed into an Orisha by ascending to heaven on a chain. Shongo is still being worshipped in some parts of Yoruba land and all over the world where you have Yoruba descendants as the god of lightning and thunder. I don't know. That kind of, uh, that was sad. How and what happened to Shongo? You know, how he lost everything. His family, his children, you know, his slaves and every other thing. And eventually had to, to kill himself. I don't know. I just, that somehow is touchy. I feel touched there somehow. And I almost, I almost uh, feel teary. I don't know if I'm the only person who feel like that. Like that's sad, you know. But again, his other good uh, exploits uh, lived on, you know. Then there come, then come uh, Oshun. So that is why they started saying that uh, Shongo Obaku, so Shongo didn't hang himself or his, you know, his worshippers, people who were like, uh, who, I mean, the, the, the early Yorubas who idolized him because they were like, that's so sad. How could we go back and say somebody that powerful eh, became vulnerable at the end of his life that he had to like hang himself? So they went to town and said, Obako, so Obako, so he did not hang himself. He did not hang. That's why they, so tomorrow they will say, Shongo Oluko, so Shongo, so Obako, so. If you do, if you if you go out there and you say Shongo hang himself back then, they will just call on him, and then you go just see this thunder and all of. This. So people were scared. He was scared. But it was sad. Oya was human beings. All of them were human beings. I mean, these people were human beings like me and you. They lived in their own time. Their notion. Oshun also spelled as Oshun, O-S-U-N, right? Oshun is another Orisha. She is a river deity that represents femininity, fertility, and love. If you call yourself a feminist, eh, you are a descendant of Oshun. But it's just that uh, these days, eh, our dear sisters and aunties, I mean, aunties who identify as a feminist, some of them have taken feminism to a different level. Some of them are actually like feminists because they hate men, because of what, what men have done to them. But the real feminists out there, they are the, you know, the, the oh God, Osho. Do you get that? She was one of the king, she was one of her king Shango's wives. You know that Oshun was Shongo's wife. Oya was Shongo's wife. One of Shongo's wives as well, right? Okay. According to legend, she was sent to help Shongo as an Irumole, a spirit. It is said that the other Irumoles sent to help the founding heroes create the world ignored Oshun and only started to respect her after Shongo 
stood up for her. There are two accounts of this story. One version claims that the female spirit sent to, I mean, to create the world wanted to be in control, but all their attempts were in vain because they lacked male approval. Another account asserts that the male Irumoles wanted to create a world free from female influence. However, doing this caused the world to fail. The first version is probably a patriarchal, I mean, so a patriarchal, a patriarchal interpretation of the second story, which is more in line with the rev, I mean, the reverence of feminine power by traditional Orisha worshippers. Even though the versions contradict each other, they both end the same way with Shango telling the spirits to respect Oshun the way they respected him. She is celebrated at Oshun Oshogbo Festival today, which is named after a sacred groove near the Oshun River. It is held annually every August for two weeks. The festival started 700 years ago after Oshun revealed himself to a hunter named Oluti Mehi and his followers when they settled at the bank of Oshun River to survive the famine that had driven them from their former settlement. Oshun instructed the people to move up the river to higher ground and promised them prosperity if they offer her an annual sacrifice. The place the people moved to is now known as the city of Oshogbo. And the sacrifice is still offered to her annually. However, the Oshun Oshogbo festival is now more than just offering sacrifices. It is recognized as an international event as it attracts worshippers and tourists from all over the world. The festival receives visitors from countries such as Brazil, Trinidad, Cuba, Jamaica, Tobago, Spain, the United States, and Canada. There's something about Oya as well. Oya was the youngest wife of Shango. Her powers were rooted in the natural world, and she controlled lightning, thunder, rainstorms, tornadoes, and hurricanes. What made her stand out among, amongst the other goddesses was her ability to relate with other women. Although she was a loving and caring mother, she could also transform into a fierce warrior in an instant. Oya is venerated around the world. Some know her to be the guardian of the realms of life and death. Hence, she controlled the activities related to death, like funerals and spiritual communications, as you know, as well as uh, reincarnation and psychic abilities. Her ability to call out or drive away the spirit of death made people fear her, since Oya was the goddess of the wind. She gives the first breath humans to take. I'll put it this way. Since Oya was the goddess of the wind, she gives the first breath humans uh, take, but she also takes the la their last breath. As the go goddess of rain, Oya gave her husband the power to create storms. So storms followed whenever she and her husband walked together. Wow. This could be anything from gentle to violent storms, capable of bringing down strong buildings. Oya met her husband in a forest. He came to kill a buffalo that he had been stalking for some time. 
Before he could strike a blow, the buffalo suddenly turned into a woman. He took her home, named her Oya, and then married her. Oya and Shango loved each other to the point that Oya followed Shango on his conquests. And when Shango died, Oya was so sad that she hid among a sheep flock to avoid being found before gathering the courage to join her husband in death. Or disappearance, as some accounts say. This action makes our, worship, makes our worshippers avoid eating sheep meat. Oya sometimes changed to buffalo, and when she left the hearth, she put one of her horns out and gave it to her children. Every year, people offer buffalo horns to the shrines of Oya so that she may continue guiding them and bless them with favors. These people are called the children of uh, buffalo. There is also another one. Agonju. Agonju is another Orisha and he is associated with the sun and volcanoes. It is not known if the real Agonju has any connection to the mythical one. Some historians believe it might just be a coincidence that the two share the same name. Regardless, Agonju, the ruler of Oyo, was brave, and during his reign, he built houses and improved the lives of the people. His reign was prosper I mean, prosperous until he fell in love with the daughter of another king. He waged war with this king for not allowing him to marry his daughter. The war claimed many lives, and during the war, Agonju killed his heir, Lugbe, because he caught him having an affair with, Iya, I mean, with Iyanyun, his wife. Agonju suffered for years due to what he had felt forced or he had felt forced to do. And he eventually died of grief. Agonju's exact relationship with Shango is unclear. But there, there appears to be some sort of relationship with, I mean, between them. Some say that Agonju was the father of Shango, while others say that they were brothers. For the historians to help us uh, dig that out. Now there is uh, this political. You know, we have uh, the early politics of Yoruba land, the economy of uh, uh, the Yoruba kingdom. And then uh, the politics of the early Yoruba kingdom. That's the part I'm going to uh, read uh, just before I call it a night. Let me tell you something, right? For the sake of uh, those who are researching and all that, I have decided that uh, I'm going to uh, dedicate a lot of uh, uh, segments on Mayegun's diary political like this. Just... Uh, to take us uh, through the histories of who we have been, our exploits, our, you know, uh, adventures, history generally. Um, I'm going to do that uh, a lot for the sake of the younger generations who are going to also uh, be, you know what I mean now? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Somebody said I'm reading from the Bible. The, uh, most of what I'm reading right now uh mob mob thank you i hope uh, it is uh close enough to what you have also read uh, in the bible there's so many so many similarities all of this happened before bible i have to say that to you you know all this history of yorubas they happened years thousands of years before anybody even wrote a bible okay just so you know as a yoruba man we had our politics of old as well, right? I'll take you to some of them as the second part of uh, this chat, okay? So thank you for spending your evening with me again. I am not talking about uh, Nigeria politics for now. I want to leave something that uh, young people will read and say, now I understand 
why Mayogun said Yoruba has done so much damages to us. I'm sorry, Nigeria has done damage, so much damages to us, trying to take away, us away from what we truly, from who we truly are. Great, great people. And another said uh, this uh, enslavement that nobody can really define, even now that uh, we are even not safe. Yeah. So thank you very much. Let's talk about uh, the politics of the early Yoruba kingdoms. Some of them that, you know, shaped what we have today as uh, Yoruba land and what we have today as Yoruba people. Talking about uh, the politics of uh, the early Yoruba land. You know, Yorubas were building cities civilizations here and there, building factories, you know, ornaments, hard work, and then we were like trading so mightily with uh, the world. But we also had our politics in the early kingdoms of Yoruba land. You see, new cities and settlements were mostly created in two different ways. The first was through wars, conflicts caused the destructions of uh, pre-existing settlements and resulted in victor merging their population with the original settlers, as seen with the founders of Elisha and Owo. The other way was building upon existing infrastructure, like what Obanta and his people did in the Jebode, where they created structures typical of a Yoruba city, like the King's Palace, King's Marketplace, and the city walls. Awamaro did the same when founding Ado in Ekiti. He left the original settlers at the foot of the Olota Rock and continued building the city around the rock. The populations in Yoruba cities or towns were segmented. Each settlement or quarter had its own leaders known as chiefs. This was especially true for the early settlers. The system of government in most Yoruba cities was a monarchical one since most of these kingdoms had their roots from Ile Ife. Most of the migrants who left Ife to settle in a new place recreated the culture and traditions of their own kingdom wherever they settled. The King's Council was formed of kings from all the quarters of the city. The chief of the largest quarter was most likely the leader of the council. Although leadership might have been and might be based on other factors, such as ancestry, history, uh, chivalry, and how famous or close they were to the king. Whenever a new group joined the city, the king's council met to decide the appropriate position for the new group leader. As the city grew, the king's council made recommendations to the king to create lower chieftaincy titles for the streets of each quarter, which would help the quarter chiefs. The king's, or should we say the king's council, which usually only consisted of five or seven men met with the king daily to make decisions concerning the kingdom. These decisions were then presented to the people as the king's decision. The council served as the highest court in the land and it could only be overturned by the king. By law, the king could not make decisions without approval from the council. The council had different names, but it functioned roughly in the same manner in the different kingdoms. 
Other lower, lower level chiefs also met with the king as his decisions were communicated to the chiefs for deliberations. If need be, they sent a message back to the king for modifications. When the king's decision was finalized, it was communicated through a town crier who would go into streets late in the evening and use a gong to garner attention before relaying the king's message. The chiefs would then see to it that the king's orders were carried out properly in their quarters. The responsibility of selecting a new king fell mainly on the king's council. The throne was hereditary, but it was not always passed directly from father to son. All male members of the royal family, including sons and grandsons of former kings, were qualified to be king. Primogeniture was rejected in Yoruba culture to reduce the incidence of parricide among the crown princes. The crown prince, known as Diaremo, basically reigned alongside his father and performed royal duties. In the event of his father's death, the Aremo was expected to commit suicide. In 1858, Allah Atiba abolished the law, and he was succeeded by his son, Adelu, after his passing. However, the Aremo still had to be elected by the council to become king. If he was found unworthy of such a position, he had to leave the city and live in a private residence in a satellite town of the kingdom. Though this course of action was not obligatory, it was usually inevitable since the new king's authority would supersede his own. He could also choose to die with his father. The council's decision on who was to be king was final, and they viewed any agitation from competitors as a crime. Though the council members could be lobbied, they held themselves to a very high moral standard. After all, a high level of accountability and discipline was expected of them. No member of the council was allowed to take gifts from those seeking the title or even from members of the public. Once a decision had been reached by the kingmakers, the person who was chosen was handed over to the right officials and priests for the coronation process to begin. The new king would live outside the palace in a compound for a few months, where he was instructed on how to behave and what to do and not to do before completing the necessary rituals. The kingmaker's council could also remove a king if they, if they gauge his action. Did you hear that? The kingmaker's council could also remove a king if they gauge his actions to be beyond the established controls of royal power. In other words, if he was immoral, greedy, or had tyrannical tendencies, there were different methods of removing a king from the throne. The council might give him an empty calabash, a type of god. Once the king opened it, he knew the council wanted him to commit suicide. He could also be given a dish of parrot eggs which would have the same message as an empty calabash. The king also might be urged to go to sleep if it seemed he could not bear the burden of kingship. This method of removal were performed to dignify the position of the king. Now, prominent wars and treaties in Yoruba land that you should know in our history.
the warlike nature of the Yoruba people is well known. So it is not surprising that uh, they were involved in many wars. With the slave trade thriving in the region, warlike individuals dominated. Still, many of the wars were fought at the behest of kings. Gaha, an elite in the Oyo Empire, during the 18th century, was named Bashorun, similar to a prime minister in 1754. This event marked a turn for the wars in the history of Oyo Empire. Ga coveted the power and authorities of the Alafi and the post almost all the Alafi is served under. Bashorunga served five Alafins. He influenced the death of four of them and tried to depose the fifth one, Alafi Abiodun Adegolu. However, he was unsuccessful in his last endeavor. This led to his death and massacre of his family. Ga was a great military leader and was beloved by his people for winning wars and protecting them from tyranny of the Alafins. But his own tyranny led to his own downfall. His actions also kick-started the fall of the Oyo Empire. After the death of Alafin Abiodun of Oyo, 1777 to 1789, his son or cousin known as Awole, also spelled as Haole Awole, was chosen as the new king. However, his reign was short and unhappy, which further contributed to the decline of Oyo Empire. According to custom, after Aule's coronation, Aule's coronation, uh, the king sent out an expedition party to fight and destroy his enemies. During Aule's reign, which lasted from 1789 to 1796, he told the expedition party to eliminate the Bale, head of, it, head of the clan of Akbomu a town located in modern-day Ondo State. This battle took place during a time when the slave trade was popular. Alafin Abiodun had passed. He had agreed with both the Oluwu of Owu and Oni of Ife to prevent the kidnapping and selling of their people. They, in turn, asked the Bale of Akpomu to help prevent such events from happening again. Aole traded along those routes, I mean, Aole traded along those routes with a friend. On one occasion, he decided to sell his friend, and it was, it was reported to the Bale of Akbomo that an Oyo man was being sold as a slave. The Bale of Akbomo swooped into the forest Right, and you know, and arrest the individuals involved in this act of uh, slavery. In the course of the investigation, it was discovered that Haole was the culprit. But since Haole was a prince, he could not be dealt with to the full extent of the law. The Bale didn't want judgment to be carried to be miscarried, so Haole was ordered to be flogged. Ever since then, Haole held a grudge, and this grudge manifested into actual conflict once he became king. The Bale of Akpomu ran to Oni of Ife to seek aid, but the Oni could not save him. The Bale of Akpomu committed suicide to appease the offended Alafi and to prevent him from destroying his people. Regardless, according to tradition, an ex expedition had to be sent out, and Aule was asked who his enemy were. He replied, saying, 
my enemies are too formidable. When further pressed to reveal his enemy, he named Afonja a powerful chief. It is likely Aole named him because the Allah of him could see him being a potential source of trouble. During this period, Afonja, I mean, Afonja resided in Ilori, an important military outpost in Oyo. Afonja held the title of Kakanfo, which is similar to a modern-day general. However, it took some maneuvering to get the title. After the former Kakanfo's death, Afonja demanded the title. But since he was a prince connected to the throne through his mother's side, the title was deemed to be beneath him. Eventually, the, the king, Haole, granted Afonja, Afonja's wish. As Afonja was a powerful individual who was willing to go to war for the title. Also, taking any action against Afonja would mean the outbreak of a civil war because many chiefs were loyal to him. Nevertheless, Afonja was added to Aule's list of enemies. Eventually, though, other chiefs, other chiefs turned against Aule, namely Ashamu and Bashoru. His quarrel with Bashoru was over a Ausa trader who had lost his goods. This trader directly implored the king to help him get his Quran which was incredibly important to him. The king ordered goods to be found, I mean, ordered the, the goods to be found and returned, but the Quran was not returned. Although the trailer, I mean, sorry, the trader did receive all his other goods, the Aousa man pled his priceless possession and the, I mean, well, put it this way, the Aousa man pled for his uh, priceless possession and the king insisted the search must continue. The Bashorun, who knew where it was, refused to tell the king the truth. The king was deeply insulted by this, and he apparently said, Has it come to this, that my command cannot be obeyed in my capital? Must it be said that I fail to redress the grievance of a stranger in my town, that he appealed to me in vain? So the king said to Basharun, If you cannot find it, my father, the deity Shongo, who was known for punishing thieves by burning the perpetrator's house, will find it for me. The next day, lightning struck Basharun's house, and Basharun was angry with the king for making, him, for, for making him out to be a liar and a thief. Another chief who was added to Aule's long list of enemies was Lafiano, the Owota, believed to be a title of some kind. Lafiano had once protected the Jan, La Jan Kalawa, a man who had offended the late king and escaped to Bariba country, located in modern day northeast Benin. So after Allah Finabiodun's death, Jan Kalawa returned, which annoyed the late king's wives. They complained and, I mean, and implored Haole to avenge this slight against the prior king. After numerous appeal, Haole yielded and ordered the arrest and execution of Jan Kalawa. The Owota was angry for not being consulted. As the man had been under protection, his ego was bruised since he had not been respected. So, Bashoru, Kakanfo, and Owota became king's enemies, and they conspired together. The king was unwilling to confront Kakanfo Edon, but he was advised by his counselors to send Kakanfo to attack Iwere, a fortified city. Weapons were practically useless against Iwere army. Back then, the Kakanfo's oath of office stated that he must either win within three months or die. Since Iwere was impenetrable, I mean impregnable, he would more than likely have to commit suicide. The counselors decided not to warn the Kakanfo 
about this until he had been led to the foot of uh, the hill where Iwiri was built. However, however, intelligence by the conspiracy reached Kakanfo. You know who was the Kakanfo? Are on a Kakanfo? Afonja now, in a lorry. How they considered all of them as his enemies? Or by Lekwe, that's what they call Aole, or by Lekwe. So he wanted to send his enemy eh, to go and die against the tradition. That's what happened there. But there were other informants who told the Afonja in Elori, you see that war, that expedition that uh, the king is sending you, he's sending you to your death. Oh. He knows you can't fight Iquiri. I mean, Iquiri, you can't fight them. If you go there, you are going to die. Eventually, you have to go and commit suicide. This is what Afonja did. However, hmm? so upon reaching the foot of Iwere Hill, Kakanfo attacked the royal party, which consisted of the king's brother, Enoch's soldiers, and slaves, claiming that the king has set him and his army up for defeat by, fight, by fighting an impregnable town. Turning the army around, Kakanfo with the Bashonu, and the water at the head of the army turned towards Oyo. The king sent word to inquire if the expedition was successful. The conspiring chiefs then sent word back, saying the royal party had insulted them and that the event that had unfolded had been unfortunate. The king asked them to come and personally inform him. However, the rebelling chiefs camped outside the capital and sent the king an empty calabash, a message telling him to commit suicide. But before committing suicide, Haole took three, crown, I mean, three arrows and an earthenware dish. He fired the arrows to the north, to the south, to the west, and offering a course upon the chiefs since they had been disloyal disobedient to him. Their children will be disobedient. When sent out on an errand, they would never return. How they then broke the calabash, which signifies that, I mean, signified that the course could not be reversed. After doing this, How they took some poison and died. After pillaging the city and the palace, the chiefs and their forces disbanded. The end, I mean, this ended an unhappy seven-year reign and began the nation's disintegration into tribal wars for independence. The successor, Prince Adebo, became king at an unfortunate time and he only spent 130 days on the throne. During this period, rebellion was the order of the day. He was essentially a king with no authority and power. Tributes were not sent to him. Law and justice were subverted. And towns attacked each other to increase their wealth and power. Even the king's messengers no longer respected the ruler. Afonja, the Kakanfo, and Okwele, the Bale of Bogun, were the first to declare independence. Okwele was the only chief Afonja respected, but he unfortunately died while fighting. Having no real rival, Afonja decided to pillage the towns and cities surrounding the capital to isolate it. In around 1817, to further strengthen his position, Afonja invited a Muslim priest called or named Halimi to Ilori to serve as his personal priest. Halimi accepted the position and also brought some Hausa slaves, whom Afonja deployed as soldiers. Afonja also invited a rich friend named Sholak Beru, who could potentially help finance the war effort. Ojo, Ojo, no, Ojo, Agumba, I mean, sorry, I can't keep going later. Ojo Agun 
Bambaru was one of Bashorunga's children who had survived the massacre. He escaped to Bariba country. After becoming aware of the happenings in the States, he decided to come back and exploit the opportunity to avenge his father and get a title for himself. He brought a large army from Bariba and killed chiefs who were friends or allies with Afonja, doing so under the pretext of avenging the king. In total, it is thought that Ojo killed more than 100 chiefs who could oppose him. I mean, who, yeah, who could oppose him? With Lafiano, the Owota being his first victim. After taking over Oyo, Ojo set a course for Ilorin to fight, to fight Afonja. Ojo's campaign did not enjoy the support of other chiefs due to the indiscriminate uh, killings of rulers. If Ojo had not killed so many chiefs, it is possible that they might have pitied his plight and joined him in going to war against Afonja. As he was only growing stronger as time passed, Ojo also threatened Adegun, the Oniko Yu of Ikoyile, who could have been a great addition to his camp. Ikoyile was located 10 miles from Oyo, and it was founded by a different Adegun, one of Oduduwa's descendants. Ojo's army wrecked so much destruction that towns deserted, sorry, towns deserted it, approached. The Oyo people following him did so out of fear, not out of loyalty. The Onikoyi, Afonja's friend, even secretly joined Ojo's ranks, keeping Afonja abreast of Ojo's policies and movements. The Oyo people and the Onikoyi hatched a plan to desert and um, to desert Ojo during the heat of uh, battle. Afonja met Ojo's army far from Ilorin, and a battle ensued. Afonja was defeated in three engagements, consist I mean, costing him most of his soldiers. Afonja fled back to Ilorin to fortify the city's defenses with stockades made from sheer and locust uh, trees since Ilori had no walls. Oniko Yi and his men besieged Ilori, and Afonja had a hard time beating the, attacker, I mean, beating the attackers back. The Oniko Yi sent a message to Afonja to persevere a bit longer. Right when the city was about to fall, the Oniko Yi and his men retreated, leaving Ojo behind, who lost the battle. Ojo was deserted by those he thought he was fighting for. Somehow, he managed to escape death and he retreated back to Bariba country. There are more wars. In 1823 to 1824, Afonja was killed by the Aousa Jamans, enlisted soldiers. They had been ordered eh, to do so by Alimi, Afonja's priest. This shocked and bewildered everyone. Since Afoja had been the Kakanfo, it also threw the Yoruba nation into disarray. A conclave was called to unite and avenge his death, not knowing that Alimi, who was now controlling Ilorin, as many Yoruba Muslims clerics started to emerge. Angono, they said a conclave was called to unite and avenge his death, not knowing that Alimi, who was now controlling a lorry, had prepared for the conflict. This was how Islam took hold in a lorry. As many Yoruba Muslim clerics started to emerge. From here on, the religion began to spread through clerics until it became popular among the commoners and the people in the Yoruba palaces. Halimi had studied the Yorubas for a long time and understood how to defeat them. The Bale of Ogbomosho, a town close to Oyoile, was elevated to the position of Kakanfo, and he united the whole nation to chase the Fulani out of Ilori. The Fulanis remain one of the largest ethnic groups in, uh, uh, in West Africa, and they are primarily Muslim. Toyeje and his men decided to camp in Ogele, located in 
Edo region. There, they fought the Fulanese, who were led by Sholak Beru, Afonja's rich friend. The Fulanese were victorious in this bloody battle, which led to the destructions of many towns. The Fulanese pursued the Yorubas vigorously, so the refugees only had a limited amount of time to choose a few of their personal things to take or else risk being captured. Children went missing, and older people were sometimes left behind. The people were bare, I mean, the, the people were bereft of money and items of value, reducing them to a life of poverty and misery. Thus, the Yoruba's first attempt to retrieve Ilori resulted in a sound defeat for them. Then 1824 and 1825, the Mugba-Mugba War. After a brief period of rest, the Yorubas decided to rally together again. This time, they were determined to chase the Fulanese and the Aousa Jomans out of Ilorin. The Yorubas allied with the kings of Raba, believed to be the Nupe king, possibly Magia or Magia II. The war commenced sometimes between March and April of 1824. Many towns and villages were already devastated from the previous war. So by the time the second war erupted, the country was on the brink of famine. Since farmlands were not tended to because of the previous war, the Yorubas and the Fulanese devoured the food they found on the Loring farms. When nothing was left, they started eating locust fruits. Igba, hence the name Mugba, Mugba, or Mugba, Mugba, or Mugba, Mugba. Mu in Yoruba means take, drink, or bring something. Thus, Muigba, Muigba, I mean Muigba, Muigba, or Muigba, Muigba, put together as Mugba, Mugba, would mean to take low-cost fruits. The Fulanis and their cavalry triumphed against the Yorubas because they did not understand how to defeat Fulani horsemen, causing them to lose courage and strength. During the battle, the Fulanese employed a new tactic in which they left their main cavalry at the rear of the Yorubas and attacked with a few horsemen during the heat of the battle. This allowed the cavalry to quickly attack from the rear and destroy the Yorubas. The Fulanese triumphed easily with their horses in open fields, and when the Yorubas fled to fortify towns, they only found famine, which was further exacerbated by the ensuing siege. The king escaped to Rabah, leaving the Yorubas at the mercy of the, at the, mercy of the Fulanese, who were now emboldened with the taste of victory they decided to pillage all of the towns in direction of Ofa, Eri, and Ibono, with their inhabitants and kings escaping to Ikui. Then, the Battle of uh, Pamo, 1825 to 1831. Ilori was eventually delivered into the hands of the Fulanese. After the death of Alimi, the sources are unclear when this actually happened, which is a problem that plagued much of Yoruba history. It was succeeded by Abdul Salami, his son, who became the first emir of Ilori, solidifying the family's claim to Ilori. To better understand the family's desire to claim Ilori, we have, we have, to, start, I mean, so we have to go back and look at Alimi's history in the city. During Afonja's reign, Alimi had been greatly displeased with Afonja's excesses and wanted to leave. He had never intended to stay for long in the first place, but he was begged to stay in the city by the Yoruba leaders. They wanted someone to keep Afonja's ambition in check. 
and they greatly respected the Muslim priest. So, he sent for his wife, who was apparently barren. His wife consulted with another Muslim priest about her barrenness, and she was told to give a slave as, I mean, as arms to a distinguished Muslim priest. The greatest priest she knew was her own husband. So, just a moment, sorry. Sorry about that. So the greatest priest she knew was her own husband. So she gave one of her female slaves to Alimi. This slave gave birth to Alimi's two eldest sons, Abdul Salami and Shita. Alimi's wife also became pregnant. The barren wife became pregnant. And she gave birth to another son whom they named Sumonu, also known as uh, Beri Bebo. Sumonu Beri Bebo. Alimi married again, and his wife gave birth to a, a yet another son. Together, these four sons would inherit Alimi's, I mean, Alimi's properties after his death. So Abdul Salami and his full-blooded brother took over the city, leaving nothing to the first wife's son. It is unknown if the fourth son received anything. It is possible that he had died by this time. With the two, with the brothers' newfound power, they decided to conquer Yoruba land. They played unsuspecting Yoruba leaders against each other. This, or should I say, these leaders were jealous of each other's strength, fame, and military conquests. And their antagonistic and petty feelings led to many defeats among the Yoruba chiefs who stood no chance without being united. So, Kaka and Foto Yeje quarreled with Oniko Yi Adegun, which led to war. To strengthen his position, Kaka and Fo formed a league with Timi of Ede, Sholak Beru of Elorin, and Olu Iwo of Iwo to besiege Ikoyi. Sholak Beru already had a personal vendetta against Adegun, for not paying him the proper homage. The Allied forces camped in the city of Pamo, and from there, they fought against the people of Ikoyi, almost subduing the city. A refugee living in the city actually saved the day by asking the Onikoyi if he could be allowed to use his wisdom to save the city. The Onikoyi was tired of the war and looking for a peace uh, a peaceful settlement. So this request was granted. The refugee decided to send a private messenger to Abdul Salami in the name in the Onikoyi's name, saying he pledged allegiance to the Emir of Ilori. Upon hearing this, the Emir told Sholak Beru to withdraw, but he refused. After successive orders with the same outcome. Abdul Salami asked the chiefs, princes, and any lawyer personnel to immediately return home, leaving Sholak Beru alone. In order to raise the siege, the Emir sent out another force to reinforce Ikoyi. But after reaching Ikoyi, the Ilorin soldiers drank themselves to a stupor for 10 days. On the 11th day, they joined forces with Onikoyi they defeated Kaka and Fotoyeje's army, leaving great men dead on the battlefield. Sholak Beru fled back to Ilori. Although he was allowed to stay there, Sholak Beru greatly resented the Emir, a feeling that was uh, reciprocated. Every incident in the city seemed to increase the tension between the two men until it led to war. The Emir besieged Okesuno, where Sholak Beru was residing. Eventually, the people, of Oke, I mean, the people at Okesuno had to face facts as they were all suffering from famine. In the end, Sholak Beru was killed. Abdul Salami was now without a major opponent. The only Koyi had pledged allegiance to him and the Kakanfo's army destroyed. Thus, 
Abdul Salami decided to declare himself the king of Yoruba land. The rest of Yoruba towns were made to give tributes. Abdul Salami used his Germans to help with this. And they ended up oppressing the people, taking their livestock, wives, and children whenever they choose to. Yes, that happened. Fulani took over Yoruba land because of the selfish and the greed of our, and the ego of our progenitors who once kept us safe. We lost everything. Then the Owu War. With the Fulanis victorious and most of the kingdoms in disarray, each state claimed independence and sovereignty and fought for its own interests. The people of Ijebu and Ife, towards the southeast, respectively, allied together against the Owus. The Owu people were known for their stubbornness, immorality, hardiness, and arrogance. Although the Owus' mannerism were different from the Oyos, they always stood by their laughing. The Owu people were also great warriors, with their weapons of choice being the cutlass and bow and arrow. The war between the Owus and Oyo, I mean the Owus and Oyo started during the, during the reign of King Gabiodun, the Obabiodun. So who gave an order saying that the Oyo people must not be kidnapped and sold at Akbomo? In around 1821, a similar order came from Ikoyi, Onikoyi Adegun, and Kakan Fotoyeje. When their armies carried out these orders, they ended up destroying several towns all of which were Ife territories. The Oni of Ife was greatly displeased by this, and he declared war on Owu, entrusting the command to Shingunshin. Yani I mean, Shigun the party camped at Confluence of Oshun and Oba Rivers in a farm village called Dari Agbon. The Ife considered themselves to be very brave and warlike, so they thought victory would be easy. However, the Owus, upon hearing the news of the war, immediately set out to engage their enemies whom they annihilated. The few Ifes who lived to tell the tale escaped to Iwo, but fearing reprisals from the Owus, the king of Iwo told the Ifes they could not stay. However, the I mean, he sympathized so much with their cause that he allowed them to gather forces together and prepare for another attack in Adunbieye, which was nearby. The Ifes remained there for around five years due to both shame and lack of uh, reinforcement. In the meantime, the Owu's arrogant nature caused another incident. They destroyed Akwom over a trading dispute with Ijebu. This resulted in the death of many Ijebus. The king of Iwo, advised the Ifes and Ijebus to ally against the Owus. The Ifes reinforced their forgotten army in Adumbieye, and the Ijebus, being closer to the coast, had access to guns from the Europeans and were well armed. The Owus heard about the war and rushed out with cutlass in hand to meet the Ijebus. However, their weapons were no match for the Ijebu guns, and the Owus incurred heavy losses. After regrouping, the Owus engaged the Ijebus again, suffering yet another loss. The Owus retreated a short distance away, where they regrouped and engaged the Ijebus once more. They were again defeated. With their courage broken and resigned to their fate, they retreated to Owu to fortify their city for the siege they knew was coming. The Ijebus and Ifes encamped under a tree known as the Ogungun. They engaged the Owus, who defended their town against the siege for years. Some historians say five years, while others say seven. But even though the people fought bravely, farming could not be avoided. The Owus ate large beans called Pokondo, Abikokondo, or Awuje which were thought to be unfit to eat as food. 
The Allied forces could neither crush the wall nor destroy the gates. Eventually, the Olowu opened the gate and escaped to Enomu, one of the towns under Owu rule. The chief of Enomu, though related to the Oni of Ife, protected Olowu. After the fall of Owu, the chief of Enomu was pardoned for assisting the Owu ruler. Now, after the conquest of Owu, the Allies returned to their camp by the Ogungun tree. There, they agreed that Owu should never be, be rebuilt. I mean, should never be rebuilt. The, I mean, Oje, the closest town to Owu, could not expand beyond Ogungun tree. The Owu land was still cultivated, but no building was placed on the soil. In 1873, someone built a farmhouse on Owu land. The home was immediately ordered to be destroyed, and the man was fined for putting it up. So, Owu remains unbuilt, with its ancient structures abandoned. However, people are living around the ruins, and many Owu descendants moved to Abe Okuta, which is located present-day Ogun State. This war on Owu contains a historical first as it was the first time gunpowder weapons were used by the Yorubas to fight. The war also laid the foundation for the destruction of other Egba towns and the creation of modern-day Abel Okuta and Ibadan, the latter of which is located in present-day Oyo. Ibadan is also the largest city, not just in, Af I mean, uh, in uh, Nigeria, but in, in the entire West Africa. So there are more. The rise and the fall of the Oyo Empire. Remember how Yoruba land became scattered, how greed and selfishness war scattered Yoruba land and gave room to the, uh, the Fulanese to take over Yoruba land. It happened. But well, we rose, we fought back, we pushed back, we reclaimed everything, and the Fulanese, eh, they never had the chance on the Yorubas again until now i'm tired and i hope you enjoyed the reading especially the young people who actually started, tagged along all this while yeah i just want to leave this for you thank you for joining me if you enjoy it yeah remember share it tag somebody tell them to go and listen too and the next time uh, we will continue from where we stop so thank you for sharing your evening with me and uh, to you mob mob thank you for your super chat as well I'm going to see you all some other time. But remember this. If you haven't really signed up on the YorubaUnion.org, uh, uh, the website uh, where we are going to call the centralized uh, uh, platform where you can find all Yorubas and everything Yoruba uh, in uh, you know distant future. So you can sign up there right now and meet other people too. Okay? Yeah. Sign up. YorubaUnion.org. Right? And I'll see you around. Thank you very much for your time and good night. From here.
Ojelu e suraki Aye bu ti de Aye e suraki Aye bu ti de Aye bu ti de Gogo ojelu e suraki Aye bu ti de Gogo ojelu e suraki Sugar ni ba ti se to ye ki won se omo ba de ro ni fi won ni ran o e a aye bu ti de gogo oje ku e sura ki aye bu ti de gogo oje ku e sura ki sugar ni ba ti se to ye ki won se omo ba de ro ni fi won ni ran Wafo wo be o ma ye gun o so pe wo o be be Wafo wo be ma ye gun o so pe wo o be be Oni kan sha ti se yi to ye ki won se ma won ra ilu to pe won de be o aye ma ye ko ti pe gbogbo oje du e sura ki ma ye ko ti pe Ojelu e sura ki, sugar ni ba ti se i to ye ki wase, omo ba de ro ni fi wani ro. Ha, ima ishe le, oro iki ishe fe, ima ishe le, oro iki ishe fe, eni ba ti le le bo le ru o, om